the bears of Talwadi and the man-eating tiger of Mandachi Pallam with Baira the Pujari by Kenneth Anderson. He wore only a langoti when I met him, a strip of cloth some three inches wide that passed between the thighs and connected before and behind to a piece of filthy knotted string that encircled the waist. But he was a gentleman to his fingertips, and he was and is my friend. Twenty-five long years have passed since first I met Baira, and it happened in this manner. The false dawn was lighting the eastern sky above the hills that encircle the little forest bungalow of Muthur, nestling at the foot of the lofty hill of Muthur Malai, that caused the winding jungle stream known as the Chinar River to alter its leisurely course through the dense jungle in a sharp southerly bend to complete the last seven miles of its journey through the wilds before it joined the Kaveri River in rocky cataracts at Hoganaikal. It was midsummer, and the Chinar was at the time bone dry. I had come out early and was padding noiselessly down the golden sands of the Chinar in the hope of surprising a bear, large numbers of which were accustomed at that time of the year to visit the banks of the river and gorge their fill on the luscious, purple, but somewhat astringent fruit of the jumlum tree which grew to profusion in the locality. If not a bear, I hoped to meet a panther on his way home after a night-long hunt. These animals, I knew, favoured closely skirting the undergrowth along the banks of the river on their lookout for prey that might cross the stream. Deer, in the way of Sambhar, jungle sheep, and the beautiful Cheetal were fairly plentiful in those bygone days, but such graceful quarry were not my objective that morning. I had gone about a mile from the bungalow, and the light of the false dawn was rapidly fading into that renewed period of darkness before the real dawn was to be heralded by the cry of the jungle cock and the raucous call of peafowl, when I suddenly heard a surreptitious but distinct rustle from a clump of henna bushes that grew by the stream to my left. That day I carried no torch, so cautiously approached the henna to within about ten feet and stopped. Then immediately before me I noticed that a large hole, about three feet in diameter and equally deep, had been dug, into which about a foot of water had trickled through the dry sands by subsoil percolation. This, I knew, was the work of a poacher, to attract parched deer to quench their thirst, when a well-delivered ball or hail of slugs from a muzzle-loader would end their existence and the noise I had heard had undoubtedly been made by the poacher himself, perhaps upon seeing me, or perhaps just stirring in his sleep after a night-long vigil. Calling out in Tamil for the man to come out, or I would shoot, I at first received no answer. Upon advancing a few paces, a diminutive figure stood up from the undergrowth, and stepping forward onto the river sand, prostrated himself before me, touching the earth with his forehead in three distinct salutes. Telling him to stand up, I asked who he was. Baira, a pujari, came the simple answer. Where's your gun? I demanded. Gun? What gun? How can a poor, simple man like me own a gun? I can't even shoot. I am a traveler and lost my way last night, and being very tired... I fell asleep in these bushes. Your Honor, by calling out just now, awoke me, and you ask for my gun? I have never even seen such a thing. Pick it up and bring it here, I ordered. He hesitated a few seconds, then stooped down and brought forth an ancient matchlock, some yards in length, with a butt hardly three inches across at the widest point. And that is how I met Baira, the Pujari, and my friend for twenty-five years, who has taught me most of all I now know about the jungle and its wild, carefree, fierce, but lovable and most wonderful fauna. What have you shot? I asked him. Nothing, he replied. No animal came to the water last night. What did you shoot? I demanded in a sterner tone. 
Bidding me to follow, he walked diagonally upstream towards the opposite bank. I saw a dark heap lying on the river sand, which, upon approach, turned out to be a samphar doe, a great gaping hole in her neck from which the blood had flowed to stain the fair white sands. I looked at Baira witheringly, anger and indignation in my glance. Master, we are hungry, he said simply, and if I do not hunt, we cannot eat, and if we do not eat, we shall die. Squatting on the sands a few yards away, I invited Baira to sit beside me, and taking out some pipe tobacco from my pouch, handed it to him. Receiving the tobacco from me onto the palm of his hand, he sniffed it suspiciously, and then, beaming with pleasure and satisfaction, introduced the lot into his system by the simple process of tilting back his head and pouring it down his mouth. The next few minutes were spent in silence, Baira being too busy chewing my tobacco. Master will not tell the forest guard about my gun, he then ventured anxiously. It is my only way of living, and if the guard knows, he will come and take it away. Also, I will be sent to jail, and my wife and four children will starve. Now, here was a pretty conundrum for my solution. My duty as a forest license holder was to hand over poachers to the authorities. Indeed, the terms of the license actually authorized me to help in arresting such individuals. Moreover, my conscience urged me to have no sympathy for this rascal who was ruthlessly murdering female deer by the most unsporting method of slaughtering them when they came to slake their burning thirst during the hot summer months. And yet there was something likable about the little fellow, and the degree of confidence he was now beginning to bestow upon me after our short acquaintance, or perhaps my strong tobacco had induced this trust. So avoiding the question and a direct answer, I asked him where he lived. We have no homes, no hut, and no fields, he replied. All day we wander in the forest in search of beehives. If we find one, we are lucky, for we gather the precious honey which we take to market at the village of Penagram, seven miles away. For a small pot of honey, we may get one rupee. With this we shall buy ragi which is a food grain, which may perhaps feed us for four days. If we don't find honey, we may be able to catch an odumbu, which is a large snake lizard. This is even greater luck, for not only will we eat the odumbu, whose flesh is very good for our strength, but we shall sell its tail to the native doctor at Penagram. He is a wonderful man, the doctor is. He cooks the tail and mixes with it some wonderful medicine. Then he mashes the whole thing into a fine powder, which he divides into paper packets and sells at eight annas a packet. These packets are sold to lovers and are very efficacious. If a man sprinkles just a pinch of this powder onto the left shoulder of the girl he loves, she will not be able to resist him. Here he looked at me sideways. If your honor cannot capture the heart of the lady you love, he continued confidentially, I will get some of this powder for you from this native doctor, free of charge, as he is a great friend of mine, and moreover, beholden to me for the continued supply of Odumbu's tales. All you have to do is to sprinkle a little of it on the left shoulder of the Mem Sahib you love, and she is yours forever and ever. Hastily telling him that I was not so much in love just then as to have to resort to Odumbu's tales, I bade him to continue about himself. Sometimes when we are very hungry, we dig for the roots of the jungle yam, which in these parts grows as a creeper with a three-pronged leaf. These yams or roots, when roasted in a fire or boiled with salt water and curry powder, are very tasty and good to eat. At night, my wife and children and I sleep in a hole that we have dug in the banks of the Anayabidihala River, a small tributary of the Chinar River, as you may know. In the hot weather, I go shooting, like I have done tonight. At such times, my wife or one of the children by turns remain awake all night to give the alarm should elephants approach, 
when they will then leave the hole and scramble up the bank or the big tree that grows beside our shelter. For these elephants are very dangerous and sometimes attack us. Only a year ago, one of them pulled a Pujari woman out of a similar shelter while she was asleep and trampled her to pulp. Should we shoot anything, we eat some of the meat and dry some by smoking. The rest we sell at Penagram and perhaps get 15 rupees for it. With the money we can purchase enough grain to feed the family for a whole month. Knowing this, he concluded coyly, I am sure you, the Maharaj, will not divulge the fact of my possessing the matchlock to the forest guard. Incidentally, it belonged to my father, and his father before him, who, we are told, purchased it in those days for thirty rupees. The rascal then looked at me winningly, a happy smile about the corners of his mouth, although there was an anxious look in his eyes. My sense of duty as a license holder vanished. I strangled my conscience then and there, and replied in a voice which I tried unsuccessfully to make non-committal, but it was distinctly sheepish instead. No, Baira, I shall not tell, I promise you. He sprang to his feet and prostrated himself before me, his forehead again touching the ground three times in the only form of salutation the Pujaris know. I thank you from my heart, and on behalf of my family, he said simply, henceforward we are yours to command. Having extracted a promise from Baira to call at the forest lodge later that day, as I wished to question him about the presence and movement of Carnivora in the locality, I went my way, assiduously avoiding a second glance at the murdered Samper Doe, for fear my conscience would come to life again and cause me to regret my hasty promise to this plausible adventurer. True to his word, Baira turned up at about ten that morning, and close questioning disclosed that just two nights earlier, a tiger had passed within five feet of him when sitting up for Sambhar at a spot about two miles downstream called Ariman Wodu, where another tributary joined the Chinar. He said that this animal lived in the locality, was an old tiger, and that his beat was very restricted, probably due to his age. Then he related an unusual story to the effect that a month earlier he had been hiding close to this very spot when a chital had appeared, which he had successfully accounted for with a single shot from his matchlock. It had been a bright, moonlit night, and the chital deer, having fallen in its tracks, Baira had reloaded his musket and was preparing to spend the rest of the night in sleep when a large tiger had walked out of the undergrowth and passed the dead chital, stopped, sniffed at it, and finally calmly picked it up and walked off with the prize. Baira had not dared to dispute ownership with the tiger in consideration of the fact that he was armed with a muzzle loader which took a considerable time to reload. I had no live bait with me at the time, and to procure a heifer meant sending to Penagram and probably a delay till the next day. So I decided to sit that night with Baira on the banks of Ariman Wodu after telling him definitely that at least as long as he was in my company, no deer poaching of any sort would be condoned. By 6 p.m. we were seated in an excellent and very comfortable hide that Baira had set up at the confluence of the two jungle streams. The nights were warm, and Baira wore nothing more than his lungoti. It was a lesson in patience I learned that day, for from the time Baira had first squatted in the rushes, he never moved as much as his forearm that whole long night. Nothing came that night, and by 2 a.m. I became impatient and finally fell asleep to awaken at dawn with Baira still squatting immovably beside me. Seeing my disappointment, he offered to accompany me on a tracking venture later in the morning. So after returning to the bungalow for a bath and breakfast, we were back again at Areman Wodu shortly before 9 a.m. With Baira in front, we walked upstream and had gone perhaps half a mile when we came upon the tracks of a large male tiger that had crossed the sand during the night and was making up the rocky incline of the Panapati Ridge, 
a little over a mile away. The ground was too dry for tracking, but Baira said he thought he knew some likely spots where the tiger might be lying up. And so we continued, crossing ridge after ridge, exploring the little valleys of undergrowth and dense bamboo that lay between. Once we heard the rumbling sound produced by the digestive process taking place in the cavernous stomach of an elephant. Giving the spot where he was resting a wide berth, we continued our peregrination, climbing upwards continuously to the Panapati Ridge. We had now reached shrub jungle level, and outcrops of rocky boulders appeared on all sides. Baira said that the tiger lived in one of the many caves that existed among the huge piled rocks, as did bears too. Handicapped by the stony, sun-baked earth that did not show tracks of any kind, I was for turning back, but my companion had become really interested by now and advocated pushing on over and across the ridge. Streaming with sweat from exposure to the mercilessly blazing sun, we at last reached the summit and began to descend the opposite slope. On this face the ridge was even more boulder-strewn than was the one we had just climbed. At last we came to a series of massive rocks, forming many caves. Baira advocated that I sit in the meager shade offered by an overhanging rock while he explored the vicinity. I gladly assented and sat down to cool off with the smoke while my companion slipped away amidst the sea of boulders. Within ten minutes he was back, saying excitedly that he had smelled the tiger and was sure it was hiding in one of the caves close by. By this time I was distinctly disgruntled and incredulous, and told Baira in a few terse words to cut out the bluff. He looked at me with amazement, and then I could see condescending pity written plainly across his pudgy countenance. "'Come and see for yourself.' he said shortly, and without waiting for my reply, moved off the way he had come. Following with my rifle, we approached a number of cavernous openings between piled boulders. Creeping within twenty yards of the nearest, Baira halted and beckoned me to approach silently. Can you smell it? he whispered. I sniffed carefully, but could smell nothing. There was certainly no odor such as one gets in a zoo or animal circus. I shook my head to indicate a negative reply. Stealing some distance closer, Baira halted again. Surely you can smell it now. I exercised my olfactory organ to its utmost and thought I could detect a peculiar odor, which for want of a better term I can only describe as greenish that very indefinable smell of slightly decaying vegetable matter. Only after many years have I now learned to associate the smell as that of a passing tiger. Baira looked upwards, scanning the five distinct openings that now showed between the huge boulders. He studied them in silence for a while, and then, indicating the fourth in line from us, and almost the most unlikely in my opinion, whispered, I think the tiger is in there. I looked at him in evident disbelief, but ignoring my incredulity, he beckoned me to follow him till at last, by working our way forward soundlessly and with infinite caution, we reached a stony ledge immediately below the opening he had indicated, which was just above the tops of our heads. Standing on tiptoe to peer in, I saw nothing. And then the very next second, soundlessly and as if by magic, appeared the massive head of a tiger, mild surprise written on its countenance. My bullet struck it fairly between the eyes at a range of perhaps eight feet. The tiger slid forward in a queer gliding motion and came to rest level with our faces, his massive head in repose between his forepaws, his yellow-green eyes half-closed with the approach of death, and the drip, drip, drip of a thin, dark red bloodstream that spouted from the hole in his forehead. That was the first of my very many experiences of Baira's knowledge of jungle lore. To say that I was immensely pleased at having discovered him would have been, to put it very mildly, and as the years rolled by and our mutual confidence in each other increased, 
I have never regretted that occasion in the far distant past when I lulled my conscience to sleep. I shall now tell just two of the many adventures we have experienced together, namely that of the bears of Talvari, in which Baira so nobly offered his life for mine, and the story of the man-eating tiger of Mundachi Palam. Talvari is the name given to the wide valley through the center of which trickles the mountain stream known by the same name. It is situated some eleven miles north of the spot where I first met Baira, and is quite one of the wildest spots of the Salem North Forest Division. The Talvari River takes its rise in the forest plateau of Ayur, whence it dips sharply into a mountainous gorge, locally known as Taluvabeta Gorge, but rechristened by me as Spider Valley, because of the species of enormous red and yellow spiders that weave their monstrous webs across the narrow jungle trail. These webs are somewhat oval in shape, and sometimes reach a width of over twenty feet. In the center hangs the spider itself, often nine inches from leg tip to leg tip. Despite its size, it is a very agile creature, and extremely ferocious, and its prey, the large night moths and beautiful butterflies and insects of the forest, stand no chance of escape once they become entangled in the huge web. These spiders are equally cannibalistic, and will not tolerate the presence of another member of their own tribe within their own web. I have sometimes amused myself by transporting one of these fierce creatures at the end of a stick to the web of another of its kind, when a battle royale immediately ensues, often lasting half an hour, but always ending in the death of one of the other creature, whose blood is then thoroughly sucked by the victor till the loathsome insect is so gorged that it can only just crawl back to the center of its web. The Talvari stream passes down this gorge, and then bifurcates, the lesser portion flowing southwards bordered by the towering peak of Mount Guthrian, and the small hamlet of Kempekarai, to join the Chenar River in the stream of Anaibidahalla. This area was once the stamping ground of the notorious rogue elephant of Kempekarai, which killed seven humans, two or three cattle, smashed half a dozen bullock carts, and overturned a three-ton lorry loaded with cut bamboos. However, that is another story. The main portion of the stream flows westwards for some miles, and bordering the forest block of Manchi, then turns southwestwards, crossing the forest road leading from Ancheti to Muthur and Penagram in the aforementioned valley of Talvadi. As may be imagined, all this area is densely wooded, clothed on its high reaches by miles upon miles of towering bamboo, and towards the lower levels by primeval forest, interspersed with rocky stretches till it finally flows into the Kaveri River near the fishing village of Biligundulu. The whole area, from source to estuary, forms the home of herds of wild elephants, a few bison, and invariably a tiger or two, which use the line of the stream as a regular beat. The Talvari Valley itself, abounding in rocks and very long grass, is the habitat of large panthers, many bears, and wild pig, sambhar, barking deer, and more peafowl than I have met anywhere else. My story begins at the time when Baira had sent word to me in a letter written by the postmaster of Penagram that a panther of exceptional size had taken up its abode in the valley and was regularly killing cattle all along the Muthur Anjeti road from the eleventh to the fifteenth milestone. The letter asserted that the panther was of enormous proportions, much bigger than ordinary tiger. Having some five days to spare, I motored by the shortcut road through the forest from Denkanikota to Ancheti, and past Talvadi Valley to Muthur, where I met Baira. From there we returned to the fifteenth milestone, which was right in the valley itself. The road was really execrable, with many streams to be crossed, ruts made by cart wheels, and interspersed with boulders galore, taxing the car and its springs severely. After pitching camp, we went down to the nearest cattle putty, some three-quarters of a mile distant, where I was able to hear for myself about the depredations of this panther. 
The story told was that it generally attacked the herds on their homeward journey to the pens about 5.30 p.m., and that it would select the largest cow among the stragglers for its victim. Several herdsmen had actually seen the animal and attempted to drive it from its kills, only to be met with snarls and a show of ferocity quite exceptional for a panther. The animal was not known to live in any particular spot, but, as I have said, ranged for about four miles along the road. It was difficult to persuade these herdsmen to sell me live baits, as although they realized the slaying of the panther would benefit them directly, their caste and religious obsessions were such as to oppose absolutely the practice of deliberately sacrificing a life in this way. Albeit, by various methods, I finally succeeded in purchasing two three-quarter grown animals, one of which I secured on the bank of the river itself, about a mile downstream from the road, and the second not far from the fourteenth milestone. There was now nothing to be done but wait, and as I did not deem it wise to disturb the countryside by shooting the peafowl and jungle fowl that abounded, I contented myself by strolling in the forest in other directions, both morning and evening, in the hope of accidentally meeting the panther, or perhaps a wandering tiger from the Kaveri. As luck would have it, I received news at about 7 p.m. on the third day that the panther had that very evening killed a cow belonging to another cattle putty three miles away as the herd was returning home. A runner had been sent to inform me as soon as the loss was discovered, which had accounted for the passage of time. Grabbing my rifle, torch, and overcoat, Baira and I hastened to the spot, and when still some furlongs away, I extinguished my torch, creeping forward in the wake of the herdsmen who had brought us the news, with Baira following at my rear. A half-moon was just raising its silver crescent above the ragged line of jungle hills that formed the eastern horizon, when we turned a sharp bend in the cattle track and came upon a panther crouched behind the dead bullock that lay across the track. I had armed myself with my point twelve shotgun for work at close quarters, while Baira behind me carried the Winchester. But before I could raise the gun, the panther bounded off the carcass and into the undergrowth beyond. Hastily whispering to Baira and the herdsmen to return slowly the way we had come, talking to each other in a normal tone to give the panther the impression that we had departed, I dived behind a wild plum bush that grew some twenty paces away, hoping the animal would return. The panther did not take too long to advertise its presence, for within a few minutes I heard its sawing call from the forest before me. The sound gradually receded in the direction Baira and the herdsmen had taken, by which I interpreted that it was following them at a distance, probably to ensure that they had really departed. Afterwards, there was tense silence, unbroken by any sound for perhaps the best part of an hour. And then, as if from nowhere, and unheralded by even the faintest rustle of dried leaves or crackle of broken twig, appeared an enormous panther standing over its kill, but still looking suspiciously down the track we had just traversed. Aiming behind the shoulder as best as I could in the half-light, the roar of the gun was followed by the panther leaping almost a yard into the air. Without touching earth, again it convulsed itself into a spring, and was gone before I could fire the second barrel. Its departure was heralded by the unmistakably low, rasping grunts of a wounded panther. Waiting for a few minutes till the sound died away, and realizing that nothing further could be accomplished that night, I retraced my steps to the cattle putty and back to my camp. By dawn next morning, Baira and I were at the place of my encounter. Casting about where the animal had disappeared, it did not take long for Baira to detect a blood trail on the leaves of the undergrowth through which the animal had dashed away. Hardened by the fact that at least some of my LG pellets had found their mark, I took the lead, this time armed with the rifle, Baira following close behind and guiding me on the trail. In this formation, 
It was my business to keep a sharp lookout for the animal and deal with it should it charge, while Baira, in the slightly safer position behind me, could concentrate on his tracking. Within the first hundred yards we came to a spot where the animal had laid down, as revealed by the crimson stain that covered the grass and the unmistakable outline of the body. From here the animal had slithered down the banks of a narrow nalach, densely overgrown with bushes on both sides, where following up became trebly difficult and hazardous. As we tiptoed forward, with many a halt to listen, I scanned each bush before me, striving to penetrate its recesses for a glimmer of the spotted hide, alive or dead, now we did not know. I strove to pierce with my eyes the rank undergrowth of jungle grass that grew between the bushes, and to look behind the boles of trees and rocks that fortunately were few in number just there. We had advanced a comparatively few paces in this way, when suddenly, from out of a hole in the ground before me, rose a shaggy black shape, a smaller similar shape tumbling off beside it. We had stumbled upon a mother bear with her young, asleep in the hole she had dug overnight in the bed of the Nala in her assiduous search for roots. I could see the white V-mark on her chest distinctly as she half rose to her feet, surprise and then fury showing in her beady black eyes. Down she went on all fours again to come straight at us. Thrusting the muzzle of the Winchester almost into her mouth, I pressed the trigger. Then occurred that all-important moment which balances the life or ignominious death of the hunter. A misfire. The she-bear closed her jaws on the muzzle, and with one sweep of her long-toed forepaw wrested the weapon from my grasp, so that it hung ludicrously from her mouth for a moment before she dropped it to the ground. Involuntarily I had stumbled backwards, and as the bear rose to her feet to attack my face, which is the part of a human anatomy always first bidden by these animals, Baira attempted the supreme sacrifice. Nimbly throwing himself between me and the infuriated beast, he shouted at the top of his lungs in a last-minute attempt to divert its further onslaught. He was successful only to the extent that it turned its attention upon him, seemingly to forget my existence for the moment. As he ducked his head in the very nick of time, the bear buried its fangs in Baira's right shoulder, while the long talons of its forefeet tore at his chest, sides and back. Baira went down with the bear on top of him. I sprang for the fallen rifle. Working the under lever to eject the misfired cartridge, I found to my horror that, with the force of its fall, the action of the rifle had jammed. All this took only a few seconds. Baira screamed in agony, while the bear growled savagely. Stumbling forward and using the rifle as a cudgel, I smote with the butt-end with all my might at the back of the animal's head. Fortunately, my aim was true, for the bear released Baira, and like lightning grabbed the rifle in its mouth, this time by the butt, again tearing the weapon from my grasp. It then started to bite the stock savagely. By an act of providence, the cub, which during all this time had remained in the background, a surprised and obviously terrified witness, at this juncture let out a series of frightened whimpers and yelps, and as if by magic, the attention of the irascible mother became focused on her baby, for she dropped the rifle and ran to its side. There, she sniffed it over to assure herself that all was well, and as suddenly as this unwelcome pair had appeared on the scene, they disappeared, a few last whimperings from the now reassured youngster forming the last notes to that unforgettable scene of horror from which it took me days to recover. Baira was on his hands and knees, streaming with blood and evidently in great pain. Going across to him, I removed my coat and shirt, tearing the latter into strips and attempting to bind up the more serious of his wounds and to stem the bleeding. Then, hoisting him on my back and carrying my damaged rifle, I staggered back to the cattle butty where I placed him on a charpoy or cot. Four herdsmen 
carried him to my camp, where I poured raw iodine into the wounds. Camp was struck, and in a few moments my car was jolting the fifteen miles to the village of Penagram, where at the dispensary rough first aid was rendered. By this time the poor man was faint with the loss of blood, and almost unconscious. Replacing him in the car, I covered the sixty-one miles to the town of Salem, where there was a first-class hospital in almost record time. Penicillin was unknown in those far-off days, and the first week that Byra spent in the hospital, hovering between life and death, with me at his side, was an anxious time. But his sturdy constitution won through, and after the first few days the doctors definitely pronounced him out of danger. I returned to Penagram, where Byra's wife and children had come and were anxiously awaiting news. Giving them some financial help, I also received a surprise when I was presented with the worm-eaten skin of the panther, which I had quite forgotten in the excitement and pressure of subsequent events. It appeared that the sight of vultures on a carcass had attracted some of the herdsmen of the cattle patti at Talvari, who had found the body of the animal within two hundred yards of where the adventure with the bear had occurred. It was stated to have been an outsized specimen, but as I have said, the skin was worm-eaten and beyond preserving. Returning to Salem, I left sufficient money to cover Baira's treatment, expenses, and final return to his native haunts at Muthur, but it was over two months before he could go back to his family with a slight permanent limp in his right leg due to the shortening of a damaged muscle and with many permanent scars on his body as reminder of the incident. My rifle needed a new stock, and to this day, six inches from the muzzle, it bears the marks of the she-bear's teeth. Thus ended the adventure which formed the Blood Brotherhood, so to speak, between Baira and myself, founded on his attempted cheerful sacrifice, an almost literal fulfillment of the words, Greater love than this hath no man, than that he should lay down his life for another. Many years passed after this occurrence to the occasion of my next story, that of the man-eating tiger of Mundachi Palam. Mundachi Palam, or to give its literal Tamil translation, the hollow or stream of Mundachi, is nothing more than a rivulet skirting the base of the Khat section, halfway between the 2,000-foot-high plateau occupied by the village of Penagram and the bed of the Kaveri River, only some 700 feet above sea level. This stream crosses the Ghat road, which drops steeply from Penagram to the Kaveri River at a point just about four miles from the destination of the road, where stands the fishing hamlet of Utai Malai above the famed waterfalls of Hoganaikal. The forest department has constructed a well on the banks of Mundachi Palam, beside the road to facilitate the watering of cattle, especially buffaloes and bullocks drawing heavily laden carts of timber and bamboo before they begin the remaining six miles of steep ascent to Penagram. This little well, surrounded as it is by dense jungle, except for the narrow ribbon of road and the small width of Mundachi Palam, which cross at right angles, is the spot where my story begins, and strangely enough ends, though only after many deaths, and the narrow escape of Ranga, my shikari. It was early morning, about 7.30 a.m., and droplets of dew twinkled on the grass like myriads of diamonds cast far and wide as they met, scintillated, and reflected the rays of the newly risen sun filtering through the leafy branches of the giant muthi trees and the tall straight stems of the wild cotton trees that bordered the shallow banks of Mundachi Palam. One man and two women carrying round bamboo baskets, laden with river fish, netted during the night on the Kaveri River, approached the well and laid down their heavy burdens on the low parapet wall that encircles it. The man unwound a thin fibre rope, coiled around his waist, and slipping one end of it over the narrow neck of a rounded brass lota, or vessel, carried by one of the women, let the receptacle down the well from which he presently withdrew a supply of cold, fresh water. 
In accordance with the normal village custom, where a man comes before a woman, he began to pour the contents down his throat in a steady silvery stream, not allowing his lips to touch the mouth of the vessel, for to do so was considered unhygienic. The fish were being taken to market at Penagram, and this was the last water available before tackling the stiff climb to their destination. After drinking his fill, the man returned the lota, or the vessel, to the well and twice refilled it for the benefit of the two maidens who accompanied him. They were in their twenties and wore nothing above their waists beyond the last fold of their graceful saris, which passed diagonally across one shoulder. Their smooth, dark skins glistened with sweat despite the coolness of early morning due to the heavy load of fish that they carried for four miles from the big river. After drinking, the party sat down for a few minutes, each member producing a small cloth bag from which were taken some beetle leaves, broken sections of areca nut, and semi-liquid chunum or lime of paste-like consistency. Some sections of nut were placed in an open leaf, which was liberally smeared with the chunum and then chewed with evident relish. In a few minutes, the mouths of all the members exuded blood-red saliva, which was freely expectorated thereafter in all directions. Just then, rustling and crackling was heard from the undergrowth bordering the well. These sounds ceased and began again at intervals, and thereafter there was no other sound. The trio conjectured among themselves as to the cause of these sounds, and reached the conclusion that it was some member of the deer family, probably injured by gunshot wounds, or wild dogs, or some other animal, and struggling to get to its feet. Urged on by the hope of obtaining easy meat, and undoubtedly in order to impress the females of the party, the man got up, and with a stone in his hand, walked into the jungle. The noise had momentarily ceased, and he penetrated further to try to find the cause of the disturbance. Rounding a baboul tree that grew in the midst of a clump of bushes, he was petrified when he almost walked into a pair of tigers, probably engaged in the act of mating. Now, a normal tiger is a beast with which very wide liberties may be taken. When once out fishing, I was surprised by a tiger that broke cover hardly fifteen paces away. It was difficult to tell which one of us was more alarmed by the presence of the other at the time. Anyhow, that tiger simply sheared off the way he had come, and although unarmed at the time, curiosity and natural excitement urged me to follow it to ascertain, if possible, the presence of a kill but it just kept running before me like any other village cur, till I eventually lost it among the many bushes that grew around. But there are, with tigers, certain moments when even they demand privacy. Or it may have been the urge to show off to the female of the species, an urge which I have known affect otherwise quiet men in a very surprising manner. Anyhow, this tiger definitely resented the intrusion, and with a short roar he was upon the unfortunate fish seller, burying his fangs through the back of his neck and almost severing the spinal column. Not a sound escaped the man as he fell to earth, the tiger still growling over him. The two women had heard the short roar, and recognizing the sound as that of a tiger, fled the way they had come to Utai Malai. The victim was not eaten on this occasion, the effort having been but a gesture of annoyance at being disturbed at the wrong moment, but it had taught that particular tiger the obvious helplessness of a human being. Some weeks later, a woodcutter, carrying his burden from the forest, encountered the same tiger on turning a bend in the path. Again that short roar, followed by the deadly spring, and another man lay dead, killed for no reason at all, and again the tiger did not eat. Two months passed, and a party of women had gone into the forest to gather the fruit of wild tamarind trees that grew in profusion throughout the valley. One of them had strayed a little away from the rest, 
she had stooped down to lift the basket to her head, when looking up, she met the glaring eyes of the great cat. A single shrill scream escaped her, before that short roar sounded for the third time, and the cruel fangs buried themselves in her throat. This time the jugular was severed, and the salty blood spouted into the tiger's mouth, and thus was born the man-eating tiger of Mundachi Palam. The woman was dragged away to some bushes, and there she was devoured, except for her skull, the palms of her hands, and the soles of her feet. Three more deliberate kills followed in quick succession, one at the seventh milestone of the road itself, the other by the banks of the Chenar River near to its confluence with the Kaveri, and the third but a mile from the village of Utamalai itself. In all three cases the victims were eaten or partly eaten. It was this last kill that caused the greatest consternation, leading the villagers of Utai Malai to come in deputation to Penagram to beg the authorities to take some action to rid them of the menace that now threatened their very village. Ranga, my shikari, was there at the time and promised them that he would persuade me to help, and having made the promise, travelled the hundred-odd miles to Bangalore by bus, arriving late in the evening to present his report. Now, a few words about Ranga will not be amiss at this stage. Strangely enough, I had also met him at Muthur, where I had met Baira some years earlier. Ranga was the hired driver of a buffalo cart used to haul cut bamboo from the forest to Penagram. He had initiative, however, and in his spare time was given to poaching, like Baira, with a matchlock that he hired for the occasion. He was a very different man from Baira, however in both physical and personal attributes. For he was tall and powerful compared with Baira's somewhat puny build, and showed a forceful and distinctly positive character in all his undertakings. He had spent a year in jail for the attempted murder of his first wife, whom he had stabbed in the neck in a jealous quarrel. After returning from jail, he had married again, and at the time I first met him had three children. Not being content, he later took one more wife, and now had a dozen children in all, and was a grandfather besides. He had better organizing capacity than Baira, and got things done when required. I have known him to thrash a recalcitrant man thoroughly for not obeying instructions. He has also a lucrative side to his character, trade in liquor illicitly distilled in the forest from baboul bark and other ingredients. I have myself sampled some of his produce and can tell you that it is the nearest approach to liquid fire that I have known. Lastly, he is a far more dishonest man than Baira and given to petty pilfering, especially of point twelve bore cartridges. He despises Baira, whom he looks down upon as a semi-savage. Secretly, I think he is jealous of my affection for the little Pujari. But Ranga is a brave man, staunch and reliable in the face of danger, who certainly fears no jungle animal or forest spook, as do the vast majority of other native shikaris. Unfortunately, Ranga came at a time when I was very busy and could not possibly leave the station for another fortnight. So I sent him back to Penagram with a number of addressed envelopes and instructions to write to me every second day, regardless of events. My inability to answer Ranga's first summons was perhaps indirectly responsible for two fresh tragedies that occurred before I was able at last to pick Ranga up in my car at Penagram, motor down to Muthur for Baira, and arrive at Utai Malai, where I was joined by a third henchman, an old associate named Sauri. This Sauri, like Ranga, was quite a versatile fellow, and had himself spent three months in jail for shooting and killing a wild elephant with his muzzle loader while on a poaching trip. The elephant was a half-grown cow, and had approached the hide in which Sauri lay concealed. Fearing that it might really tread upon him, Sauri had aimed his musket behind its left ear. The solid ball had only too effectively done its work, and the elephant dropped in its tracks. Unfortunately for him, he was caught red-handed. I had been shooting on the Coimbatore bank at the time and had seen and photographed the elephant, 
which incidentally was how I met Sauri. I was extremely fortunate in being able to obtain the services of these three men, as in their varied spheres and capabilities they presented a vast store of jungle experience and ability. Baira at once volunteered to scout around the neighboring forest and along the Coimbatore bank in an effort to ascertain the immediate whereabouts of the tiger. This I emphatically forbade him to do, as being suicidal. We finally compromised by agreeing that he should be accompanied by Sauri, armed with my point twelve bore gun, and another man who very surprisingly bore the name of Lucas and was a watcher in the employ of the government fisheries department. Ranga was given the job of obtaining three baits and tying them out in likely spots. The usual difficulty in obtaining animals was met but the resourceful Ranga quickly overcame it by threats and other expedients of which I was not supposed to know. The first of the three baits was tied a mile up the Chinar River from where it joined the Kaveri and the second some three miles further on, where Munda Chipalam met the Chinar. The third was tethered within hundred yards of the well where the first tragedy had occurred. On alternative days, Baira and his party would scour the forests on one bank of the Kaveri, while I, with the local guide, combed the opposite bank. Ranga, as I have said, attended to the feeding and watering of the baits. In this way, we spent four days, while nothing happened. Tiger pugs were discovered at several localities, but they were not fresh, and nobody could tell with certainty whether they belonged to the man-eater or some other animal. There was no possibility of driving the man-killer to cattle-killing to avoid starvation by prohibiting the villagers from entering the forests or using the road to Penagram. To begin with, considerable traffic existed along this road, as it formed a main artery to the many hamlets lying on the opposite bank of the Kaveri. In addition, the forests, particularly on the Coimbatore side, were plentifully stocked with game, to which the tiger could always turn in necessity. In the meantime, I endeavoured, by every possible means, to spread the news of my presence and purpose to all surrounding hamlets, in order that I might hear of any fresh kill with the least possible delay. There was then some hope, with Baira's expert help, of being able to track the animal to where it was lying up, or perhaps even to its lair. Beating was out of the question, even if there had been volunteers for the task, of which there were none, as we were dealing with a very bold and clever animal who would as likely as not add one more victim to his list from among the beaters themselves. Early in the morning of the fifth day, I received news that a man had been killed at Panapatti cattle pen some four miles away, late that previous evening. He had gone out of his hut for hundred yards to call his dog, which was missing and had not been heard of again. We hurried to the spot, and Baira was successful in discovering the spot at which the man had been attacked. The great, splayed-out pugs of the tiger were soon clearly visible across the sandy bed of the Chinar River as he had dragged his victim across and through the intervening reeds to the borders of the sloping bamboo forest beyond. Here we discovered the remains, almost totally devoured. No trees were available except for a mighty clump of bamboo that grew some thirty feet from the remains. Inside this I instructed Baira to make me a suitable hide by the simple expedient of removing some eight or nine of the stout bamboo stems, cutting through them about four feet from the ground and again at the ground level, and then taking out the intervening four-foot lengths. The upper parts of the bamboo stems, being in the center of the clump, would not fall to earth, so entangled were the tops with the fronds of neighboring stems and those of other clumps. After completing his work, Baira had succeeded in making a sort of a hollow cave for me in the midst of the clump. Seated in the middle of this, I knew I would be quite safe from attack by the tiger, either from behind or from either side, as he could not get at me owing to the numerous intervening stems. The only way he could reach me was from in front and this I felt quite capable of countering, provided I kept myself awake throughout the night. The faithful Pujari persisted in his wish to sit with me, 
till I was compelled to order him peremptorily to go. I would indeed have been glad of his company, but the space we had cleared in the midst of the bamboo clump offered only restricted accommodation to one individual. To cut more stems to increase the space meant that we were reaching the outskirts of the clump, and the unsupported bamboo stems would then fall to earth, not only causing much disturbance by the crash, but littering the surroundings with debris, which might quite possibly frighten the tiger away. The night would be dark, with no moon, so I took the precaution of clamping my spare shooting light to my shotgun, which I carried into the hide with me, in addition to the Winchester, with its own lighting arrangement. Being in the midst of the bamboo, I knew I was almost completely sheltered from the dew and the cold jungle air, and fairly safe from snakes, or so I thought. I was in position by 1 p.m., and sent my followers away, Baira still protesting with instructions to call to me from the bed of the Chinar next morning before approaching. With their departure, I was left to my own devices for the next seventeen hours. You will appreciate that from my position in the midst of the bamboo clump, my view was entirely restricted on all sides except for the narrow lane of jungle right in front of me, with the human cadaver in the foreground. Much as I would have preferred a wider range of vision, I knew I would be thankful once the hours of darkness fell, as the more I could see by day, the more I would be exposed to the man-eater after dark, when the tables would be turned and he could see while I could not. The human remains, being hidden from the sky by the canopy of overhanging bamboos, were not troubled by vultures. Flies, however, covered it in hordes, and the stench soon began to get painfully noticeable. I will not burden you with descriptions of the sounds of a jungle evening and the close of a jungle day, beyond mentioning that they were all practically present on that occasion, and offered sweet accord to my jungle-loving ears. Nothing happened before darkness set in, which it did both earnestly and rapidly, till I was left in Stygian blackness, intensified by the additional shadows cast by the towering bamboo stems above me. It was so dark that I could not see my own hands as they rested on my lap. I would have to feel for the trigger and the torch switch, and indeed everything else. All that was visible was the luminous dial of my wrist watch showing that it was a quarter to eight, ten long hours before daylight came. I knew that during this time I would have to strain myself to the utmost in pitting my poor human and town-bred skill against that of the king of the jungles at which he was a past master with decades of skillful ancestors behind him, namely at listening and hearing, for I could not see an inch before me while he could see clearly. Nor could I smell him at all, but neither could he smell me, for success I would have to depend entirely on my hearing, the sound of his soft approach, and I well knew from long experience how soundless the approach of a cautious tiger can be. I would have to remain absolutely silent myself. Worse, the slightest movement or sound from me would betray my presence to those ever-acute ears, and once he knew I was there, only one of two possible things could happen. Either his courage would fail him, and he would desert the kill, or he would attack me by a sudden pounce through the opening in front of me, before I was aware of his coming. I certainly had no wish to become the next item on his menu. Therefore, I could do nothing but sit absolutely and completely still. Mosquitoes found their way even inside that clump, and tortured me acutely. Once some cold, creeping thing passed across my lap. It had length but no legs, and was undoubtedly a snake. Movement at that time meant a bite, and if it was a poisonous snake, possibly death. With extreme difficulty I controlled my twitching nerves, and the snake glided away. I could just sense its rustle as it slipped between the intervening bamboo stems, and was gone. By and by my throat began to tickle, and I had an overpowering desire to cough. I counted sheep to divert my thoughts from this urge until it eventually died away. 
At 10.25 p.m., I heard a distinct sound in the jungle behind me, a faint rustle, and then all was still. The minutes dragged by, then it came again on my right and in line with the very clump where I was sitting. Heavy breathing was clearly audible, a very faint grunt, silence, another grunt, and then the quick rush of a heavy soft body before me. Was it on the kill, or was it staring me in the face from the inky darkness, perhaps even at that instant drawing the powerful hind legs below the supple belly to catapult itself upon me, and I could not even see the end of my own nose? I had already cocked my rifle and had slowly raised the muzzle, finger on trigger, to meet the coming onslaught at point-blank range. The perspiration poured down my face in sheer terror, and my whole body trembled with nervous suppression. I depressed the torch switch, and the brilliant beam blazed out upon a large hyena, standing above the kill, growling to find out it was a dead man that lay there. He stared blankly at the light for seconds and was gone. I could have laughed aloud with relief and the thought that I was safe once more at least for the time being. Anyhow, my position had been temporarily revealed, and I could only hope the manager was not in the vicinity to become aware of it. Hastily, I took advantage of the disturbance to swallow a mouthful of hot, refreshing tea from the flask I had brought, and quickly moved my cramped limbs before resettling myself for the remainder of my vigil. I was in Stygian darkness again, but considerably refreshed and relieved of the morbid, nervous tension that had threatened to overcome me a few minutes before. At ten minutes to twelve, I heard the moan of a tiger in the distance. This was repeated again at intervals of five to ten minutes, the last being at twelve-twenty, and from a spot I judged to be a quarter of a mile away. It was difficult to gauge the exact distance of sound, in this densely wooded locality, but I thanked Providence and my lucky stars that the tiger had decided on making a noisy approach rather than the silent one I had dreaded. A quarter of an hour slipped by without further sign. In the meantime, the usual midnightly jungle breeze had sprung up to cause the bamboo stems to groan and creak against each other weirdly. This aroused a fresh and ominous thought in my mind. Supposing one of the several cut bamboo stems balancing upright above my head was to become dislodged and slip downwards under its own weight, the cut end of the bamboo would then impale me to the ground, like some rare beetle in a collector's box. The thought was not very pleasant, and for a moment it eclipsed even the thought of the man-eater and its proximity. And then I heard the crack of a bone on the cadaver lying in the darkness before me. Slowly I lifted the rifle to shoulder level, steadied it, and depressed the torch switch for the second time that night. But nothing happened. I depressed the switch again and again, but still nothing happened. Undoubtedly the bulb had burned out, or some connection had come loose. I had now the choice of sitting very still till the tiger fed and departed, or changing my rifle for the smooth bore and attempting a shot. I quickly decided to use the gun. Ever so gently, I lowered the rifle to ground level, and then groped silently in the dark for the twelve bore. Finding it, I drew it towards me, and then began maneuvering the weapon to shoulder level. I could only hope that the tiger was looking away from me, or was too engrossed in his meal to notice all the movement that was going on in the midst of the bamboo clump. And then misfortune befell me. Slightly, but quite distinctly, the muzzle of the gun came into contact with the bamboo stem, and there was an audible knock. The sounds of feeding stopped abruptly, followed by a deep-chested and rumbling growl. Hastily I got the gun into position and pressed the switch of the new torch. Luckily it did not fail, and the beam burst forth to show clearly a huge striped form as it sprang off the cadaver and behind the bamboo clump next to mine. 
From there, a succession of earth-shaking roars rent the silence, as the man-eater demonstrated in no uncertain manner his displeasure at being disturbed and his discovery of a human being in the near vicinity. Keeping the torch alight and a sharp lookout for his sudden attack, with one hand I groped for the spare bulb I always carried in my pocket. I extracted it and kept it on my lap. Still working with one hand, I unscrewed the cover of the torch on my rifle, extracted the faulty bulb, and substituted the new one. Fortunately, the torch was one of those focused by adjustment from the rear and not the front end, and as the rifle torch was now functioning again, I extinguished that in the smooth bore, though I kept the gun ready across my knee for any further eventuality. The tiger was still demonstrating, but had moved to a position in my rear. I knew I was safe enough, except from a frontal attack. To guard against this, I would have to keep the torch alight continuously, but as over five hours still remained till daylight, there was the certainty the batteries would run low, even on both torches if burnt incessantly. So I switched off the light and relied on my hearing. When things became too silent for a long stretch, I would switch on the beam, expecting to see the creeping form of the tiger approaching me. But this did not happen, and he kept his distance, demonstrating frequently till past 2.30 a.m., when I heard his growls receding in the distance. No doubt he was disgusted, but by this time I welcomed his disgust. You may be certain I kept a sharp lookout for the rest of the night against the tiger's return, for the habits of a man-eater are often unpredictable. But the chill hours of early morning crept past without event, till at last the cheery cry of the silver-hackled jungle cock made me grateful for the dawn and the light of another day, which, on more than one occasion, during the terrible hours that had just dragged by, I had not thought of seeing. Soon the halloa of my followers from the bed of the Chenar River fell like music on my tired ears, and I shouted back for them to advance, as the coast was clear. With their arrival I staggered forth from my night-long cramped position to finish the tea that remained in my flask, and to smoke a long overdue pipe while relating the events of the night. All three of the men knew me most intimately, but although they did not say as much, it was clearly evident they were surprised to see me alive, for the roars and demonstrations of the frustrated man-eater had been clearly audible to them where they had spent the night with the shivering herdsmen of Panapati. Baira now said, that he would like to take a quick walk up to the Chinar to Muthur, just four miles away, and fetch his hunting dog, which he felt would be of considerable help in following the trail of the tiger. This dog was a very nondescript white and brown village cur, answering to the most unusual name of Kushkush Kariya. How it happened to possess this strange name, I had never been able to fathom. In calling the animal, Baira used the first two syllables in a normal tone, but would accentuate the third into a weird, rising cry resembling that of a night heron. I had never been able to emulate him in this, and had contented myself in the past with Kush Kush alone, which the dog would obey without hesitation. Insisting that he at least took Sauri as company, I returned with Ranga to Utai Malai and had a hot breakfast and a bath in the Kaveri, followed by a long overdue sleep. I awoke at 2 p.m. with the return of Baira Sauri and the much-prized Kush Kush Kariya, who wagged his tail at me in joyful recognition and nuzzled his cold snout against my shoulder. Swallowing a hasty lunch and plenty of hot tea, we returned to the spot of my night's adventure, accompanied by the relatives of the dead man, who yarned to bring away his remains, but were far too afraid to visit the spot unprotected. As may be imagined, the corpse was by this time smelling to high heaven, so they decided to carry it only as far as the Chenar River and bury the remains on the bank. With their departure, poor Kush Kush made a brave attempt to follow the cold trail of the tiger, but was not very successful in going even a hundred yards. Probably the stench that still pervaded the atmosphere 
and lingered on the quiet evening air had overpowered all faint smell that might have remained in the tiger's tracks over the hard ground. Thus, we returned to camp just before nightfall, a very disappointed group. The following day nothing happened, but on the morning of the day after, Ranga nearly met his end. Each day, as I have already said, Baira, Sauri, and I scoured the forest in opposite directions in the hope of locating the tiger. While it was Ranga's duty to feed and water our three baits, none of which had been killed up to that time. He had made an early start that morning with another villager for company and had already visited the bait at the well on Mundachi Palam, which was found untouched as expected. After depositing some of the straw carried by his companion, Ranga watered the animal and then the two men moved down to Mundachi Palam itself to look to the second bait tied at its confluence with the Chinar River. The villager was leading, Ranga bringing up the rear. They had come about a mile from the road when standing fifty yards from them in the middle of the dry stream was the tiger. The villager dropped his bundle of straw and shinned up the only tree at hand. For the few seconds it took him to climb a reasonable height, he blocked Ranga's progress, and within those few seconds the man-eater had reached the base of the tree, reared up on its hind legs, and with a raking sweep of its forepaw removed the loincloth around Ranga's waist, the end of which had hung downwards while he climbed. The tiger halted momentarily to worry the cloth, while Ranga, minus his loincloth, climbed energetically, overhauling and almost knocking his companion off the tree in his efforts to reach the higher terraces and safety. The disappointed tiger remained below, looking upwards and growling savagely, while Ranga and his companion shouted loudly for help, telling the world at large that they were being killed and eaten. Fortunately, a party of people, travelling in large numbers for safety's sake, happened to be coming from Penegram, and were at that time in the vicinity of the well, from where they heard the shouts and recognised its message. At the double, the whole group, men, women, and children of all ages, covered the remaining four miles to reach me at Utamalai with the news. Not knowing it was Ranga who had been attacked, and Baira and Sauri not having yet returned, I jog-trotted the distance alone, arriving at the well in record time. From here I could plainly hear the shouting myself. By this time the tiger had left the foot of the tree and vanished into the forest, but the two men were afraid to descend, for fear it might be in hiding and rush forth on them. Hoping to surprise the man-eater, I refrained from answering them while hastening forward as swiftly as caution permitted. When I reached the tree, however, it was only Ranga and his companion who were surprised at seeing me till I explained the circumstances. We then attempted to follow the tiger, but no signs of him were evident on the hard ground, so we desisted and turned back to visit the remaining baits. I accompanied the men, and we found both animals unscathed. It was past midday when we returned to Utamalai, with the despairing knowledge that the leery tiger we were after apparently was not going to kill any of our baits. Nor, with the experience I had had with him, was he ever likely to return to a kill again. To say I was exceedingly crestfallen and despondent would be putting it too mildly. The willy, man-eater of Mundachi Palam, looked like being one of those tigers that would stay put for a long time to come if it did not go away of its own accord to continue its depredations elsewhere. And then, about 7 a.m., two days later, came the event that brings this story to an end. As I have mentioned, in coincidence it remarkably resembled the events with which the tale started. Again, a group of persons, except that they were ten in number for the sake of safety, had placed their baskets laden with fish for penegram on the ground to water at the well beside Mundachi Palam and to rest a while. Women being in the party, one of the men stepped behind the nearest tree to ease himself. There was a short roar, an elongated golden body with black stripes hurled itself as if from nowhere, and the squatter had disappeared. By good fortune, 
Baira, Ranga, Sauri and myself had set forth in company to visit our baits and were hardly a mile behind the party of ten. Soon we met the nine who were returning with the sad news of the one who was not. Running forward as fast as we could, we reached the well, where I whispered to Ranga and Sauri to climb up adjacent trees and await my further need. Baira and I crept forward, and behind the tree chosen by the unfortunate man to answer the call of nature, we picked up the trail of his blood as it had ebbed away in the jaws of the tiger. With Baira tracking, and closely in his wake, with rifle to shoulder, and scanning every bush, we had penetrated only a short hundred yards, when we heard the sharp snap of a bone in the mouth of the feeding tiger. The sound had come from a half-left direction ahead of us. Laying a restraining hand on Baira, I motioned him to remain where he was, while I crept cautiously forward, knowing full well that under such circumstances a companion becomes an additional life to care for. The forest was still and breathless, and the sound of gnawing and crunching could now be heard more clearly. Very carefully and silently edging closer, with downcast eyes, watching each footstep, for fear I should rustle a leaf, snap a twig, or overturn a loose stone, it took me a considerable time to advance a mere fifteen yards. From there I thought I could see the slayer crouched on the ground. A few paces nearer, and suddenly he arose and faced me, a dripping human arm torn off at the shoulder held across his mouth. The wicked eyes gazed at me with blank surprise. Then a snarl began to contort the giant face, rendered more awful by the gruesome remains it carried. The three hundred grains of cordite behind the soft-nosed Winchester bullet propelled the missile with upwards of thirty-five tons to the square inch, correctly into the base of the massive neck. The human arm dropped into the grass with a plop. The animal lurched forward with a gurgling grunt, quick working of the under-lever of the old trusted rifle, and a second missile buried itself in that wicked heart. It beat no more. The man-eating tiger of Mundachi Palam lurched forward to his end in almost the same spot where he had begun his wicked career months before. A large male, he was without blemish. Undoubtedly a wicked tiger by nature, he had evidently turned man-eater through an unlucky chance. On such trivial circumstances often hang the threads of fate. Anxious about my welfare, my wife surprised me by arriving that same afternoon in her car from Bangalore to ask me whether I ever remembered I had a home and a family, and if it was not about time I thought of returning to it. We motored Baira via Penegram back to his dugout near Muthur, where we were just in time to be present at the happy arrival of his fifth progeny, and the arrival was in this fashion. A shallow hole, hammock-shaped, and about of the same dimension had been scooped in the sands of the Chenar River, the hollow then being liberally filled with soft green leaves, freshly separated from their stalks. In this hammock the mother, about to give birth, lay when the pains of childbirth began. The husband acted as midwife. No medicines, no ergot, no hot water, no cotton wool, only tender green leaves, and the sharp edge of a flint to saw through the navel cord, the bleeding stump of which is staunched with ashes from an ordinary wood fire. A couple of hours after giving birth, the mother got up with her baby and went to the hole on the banks of Anai Bidahalla, where they lived. The husband filled in the hammock-like hollow, leaves, placenta and all, with the loose sands of the Chenar River. In such simple and hardy fashion are the Bairas of the forest born. And so do they live, and so do they die, true children of nature and of the jungle. Long may they continue to exist, untrammeled and untarnished by civilization, happy and free to roam as they will over mountain, fen and forest glen, till death claims them, and they return unostentatiously to Mother Earth, from which they have so unostentatiously sprung. On the morning of that day I had shot a peacock, and this we had for dinner, prepared in the jungle fashion. All feathers are removed, with the entrails, head and neck. 
Incisions with a knife are made in the flesh of the bird, into which are inserted salt, spices, cloves, and curry powder to taste. The hole is then plastered over with fresh, clean mud from the river bank to a thickness of well over an inch, so that it finally resembles a ball of wet mud. A fire of embers is built, the ball placed on it, and surrounded on all sides and above with still more embers. The fire is kept continuously alive by the addition of more wood, but the aim is to have glowing embers, rather than a blazing fire. After some time, the mud begins to crack, and finally falls away in sections. Then is the time to remove the bird before it is burnt. With a little practice in the art of mud roasting, a truly superb roasted peacock or jungle fowl can be prepared for dinner, the finished product putting many a housewife to shame. The End <laughs>